Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here. We appreciate those of you who, who made the time tonight. I know uh, we chose a night the day before a day off, and that was probably a, a poor selection on my part, and I apologize for that. But we are airing this tonight as well, and we'll record it. So anyone who's unable to be here tonight, um, we felt like it was important um, to, to give everyone in our, in our district a chance to understand the work that we've done so far as well as where we're going, the work that we have ahead of us um, and, and, and where we're going and, and give you an opportunity to ask questions and certainly give us feedback on where we're going as a district. So uh, for those of you who may not know me, I'm Dan Snowberger, I'm the superintendent. It's uh, almost been a year, it's hard to believe. It's uh, about 11 months uh, since I joined the team here. Um, all of you know our school board um, and I really appreciate their support of the work that we've been doing here in the district. Uh, most of you know our district leadership team, uh, Dr. Bill Dallas, who's our assistant superintendent. Sadly, uh, most of you have heard that Dr. Dallas is leaving us. He uh, was lured back to his home. He had spent a long time in Fountain Fort Carson School District uh, before being hired by uh, the former superintendent uh, to come and join our team as an assistant superintendent and then ending up being interim superintendent here in the district. Um, and then being my partner for the last 11 months here. Um, Dr. Dallas is returning as an assistant superintendent in a district that he knows very well. And so um, Dr. Dallas uh, is part of our team. Uh, Rebecca Brooks is just past her year mark as our chief financial officer after Ron uh, Padera um, retired as uh, our chief financial officer, had been here for a long, long time in the district. Uh, Rebecca is doing an amazing job as our chief financial officer, and you'll see some of the work that she's been doing. Jeremy Casey is our director of safety and security. Jeremy comes uh, retired from the Secret Service. Uh, Jeremy um, brings a lot of uh, deep experience uh, from the Secret Service here to the district um, and has been an amazing addition to our team. Jason Hackett, who is here in the audience, Jason is our public information officer, officer and has done a great job in keeping you informed. I know the Good News Bulletin is a weekly uh, publication he does as well as lots of other information items that he gets out, lots of videos he produces as well as some podcasts that he's done. So we appreciate Jason. Uh, Terry Maher is our Director of Food and Nutrition. Uh, Tiara No is our interim director of transportation. Tiara graduated from Elizabeth School District and has just taken over our transportation department. Uh, Tiara is uh, just an amazing uh, individual and knows this community like the back of her hand. So we really are glad to have her as part of our leadership team. Mark Oser has been in the district forever um, and really knows every building um, from top to bottom. Uh, John Rogerson is new to our district this year as our Director of Human Resources, has many years in education, former superintendent as well. Kimberly Seafried is our Director of Special Services and Marty Silva is our Director of Technology. And today we just announced our new Chief Academic Officer who will take the place of Dr. Uh, Dallas as he departs, uh, Dr. Or, um, Kimberly is uh, also um, uh, has been a chief academic officer, former principal, um, has 21 uh, years of experience in public education, former principal as well. So we're really excited uh, that she will be joining our team. So the areas we're gonna talk about tonight is our financial position as a district. We want you to be uh, familiar with the work that we've done to put ourselves in a better financial position. We wanna talk about our work that we've done around staff retention and attraction. Um, We've been a revolving door as a district and we wanna explain why and help you understand the work that we're doing to try to change that. We wanna talk a little about our curriculum and instruction alignment work that we've been doing over the last actually two years. Dr. Dallas began this work last year, so it's not work new this year, uh, but it's work that we've really gotten some traction on this year and work that will continue. Uh, talk a little about safety and security in the district um, and give you a little more detail about where we are and where we're going. A little about the growth in our community and the work that we plan to do moving forward. 
And then a little about the declining parental involvement we see, as well as parental rights and some of the things that we've been trying to do to make sure that we outline for you not only parental rights, but also parental responsibility. So let's first talk a little about our financial health as a district. So over the past three years, we've had this phenomena of spending down our financial fund balance. And so we've been flagged by the state of Colorado. Um, so for the past three years, we have had a financial audit conducted by, the, by which we're required to. We do a financial audit. And then the state auditor um, reviews our financial audit. And they have a number of financial indicators they look for. And we've had our financial fund balance flagged now for three years. And so the superintendent over the last three years, me this year, have had to go before the state audit committee uh, to address why is our fund balance decreasing. And so we have been spending more than we have been bringing in for the past three years. And so that's obviously not a trend we want to continue. Um, so that's been a challenge that we need to address as a district. We also have only expected our district to maintain a fund balance of 2%. Why is that a problem? Well, we, not too long ago, went through a recession. And in that recession, the state balanced the budget on the back of public education. The state, when they couldn't fund everything in the state, created what they called a budget stabilization factor. And what they did was they said, well, the one thing we can hold money back from is public education. And so the budget stabilization factor, which has become known as the BS factor, appropriately, um, was an IOU to public education. And so in, at, at its highest mark in the state of Colorado, many districts were owned, owed millions of dollars, meaning we should give you millions of dollars more, but we can't. So it's an IOU. Sorry, we can't give you that. And so here's the money we can. And so we this year actually should receive $311,000 more than we were given. And so the governor, our current governor, has been trying to eliminate the budget stabilization factor. And in his budget for next year, he is proposing eliminating that. So fingers crossed that will happen. He has, to his credit, over the last several years, has been eliminating the budget stabilization factor. The challenge is with a 2% fund balance, if we go back into recession, guess what the state will do? They will say, oh, we have to balance a budget. We can't take away from Medicaid. We can't take away from other state projects. Where are they going to take from? They've already gotten it through the Colorado Supreme Court. They will take back from public education. And so if we as a school district don't build a fund balance, we will again have money taken from us. And if we only have a 2% fund balance, we will be forced to cut teachers, we will be forced to cut programs, and that's concerning. And so we must, as a school district, do something to change that. So we are working to do that, and I'll tell you what we're gonna do in a minute. We've also worked to create some greater transparency in our budget. So if you look back last year, you'll see a budget that says, here's how much Running Creek has, and here's how much Singing Hills has, and here's how much Elizabeth High School has, and here's how much um, superintendent's office has, and board has, and so on and so forth. But you really don't see how those funds are being spent in different categories. If you look at our budget this year, you will see a greater breakdown by department. And that's really important because we want you as taxpayers to be able to hold us accountable, to, to be able to say, we don't think you're spending your money wisely because it is not our money, it's your money. You fund schools through your taxes and we wanna make sure that we're transparent. And so we would like you to be able to look at our, our budget and that's posted online. So we've increased our transparency in our budget, and we believe that's important to build trust in our community. 
We have also started a zero-based budgeting process. In the past, if technology always had a budget of $400,000, next year, guess what? Technology got $400,000. Well, we are saying, no, technology, come to us and tell us what you need. What, 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 what are the parts and the, the network pieces and the network technology that needs to be in, uh, replaced? What are the things that have to happen next year and what's the cost of those? And let's assume you get nothing and tell us what you need. And so we have shifted our mindset, not from you've always had $400,000, here it is, to tell us what you need. And so we've shifted our mindset and the way that we budget as a district so that we can make sure that the year you need more, you get it, and the year you don't need so much that we have the ability of shifting that money into areas that are needed. That may sound really basic, but we have to be able to start shifting our money into areas so that we can fund the needs in the district. We've also had very little consistent investment in infrastructure. And so I can tell you in this building here, we have 25-year-old boilers. Now, you don't want to operate a school district hoping that your boilers make it through another year. The reality is we should be setting aside money every year so that when a boiler gets to its life cycle age, that we have money ready to replace it. And so we have to shift our thinking and our budgeting so that we can begin setting aside money so that when things are ready to be replaced, the money is there to be replaced. Part of our fund balance in that 2% fund balance has been money that we were required to set aside for projects that in the past we received grants for things like the DHS roof. So we received money to replace the roof here at DHS not too long ago, and part of the agreement was that we would begin setting aside money for the DHS roof. And so that money was counted as fund balance set aside. Now is that money we can really spend for anything else? No. So that money really isn't fund balance. And so we'll explain where we now are putting that money, okay? We also have had a challenge with transportation and we have one of our uh, transportation staff here tonight. We have an extremely old bus fleet. We have nine buses, I believe, last count, that are down right now. We have nine buses that are in for repair. Those buses require significant repair before they can go back out on the, on the road. We don't put buses on the road that are not safe for children to ride in. So we, we have this challenge that we've got to buy new buses. Well, we bought four buses last summer and we're still waiting for them because we have a supply chain issue. <laughs> You don't just go to a bus lot and say, I'll take those four buses. You order four buses, and a year and three months later, you get them. And so we're hoping the buses we ordered in April of last year will be here in July. And so we'll have four new buses. We're about to order more buses for next year that probably will arrive next July. And so we really are finding ourselves behind in trying to ensure that we can catch up on the fact that we have an old fleet. We bought 10 buses seven years ago and they were financed for seven years. We're still paying for those buses that are now seven years old. And so we've made decisions in the past paying for things that now are aged out and we're still paying for them. And so we have to get our financial house in order. The four buses we bought last summer that we don't have yet, we're paying for. So when they arrive, they're paid for. We're not, we're not paying payments for them. They will be paid for. The four buses we're ordering now, when they arrive next summer, will be paid for. So, so that we won't have payments that we're gonna to have to burden future boards with, they will be paid for. So we have to get our financial house in order 
so that we won't continue to burden future budgets on things that are already aging out that become a burden on future budgets. We also have a huge challenge with other vehicles in our fleet. We have uh, pickup trucks that our maintenance staff drive around that have rusted floorboards that you can see the road. We have plow trucks that have rusted floorboards. We have Suburbans that are 1985 mint, minted that drive kids to Colorado Springs to the School of the Deaf and the Blind. We have school, uh, Suburbans that are early 2000s. We, have, we call that the white fleet. Um, those are vehicles that have to be replaced. And so we're working right now trying to negotiate with rental car companies who have vehicles that rotate out at 32,000 miles to try to see if we can't purchase some of those with 32,000 miles that are going to be far better than our 1985 and 2000 vintage white fleet vehicles that um, obviously are concerning because obviously we're, we've got vehicles that are so old. And so these are some of the challenges that we're trying to deal with. And we're trying to support our, our transportation department that's done an amazing job with what they have. Um, but, but obviously, we need to make sure that we get on a plan so that we don't put them in a position where they're trying to do the impossible uh, with very old vehicles. So what's our solution? The board and I have set a new policy into place that says in five years, we will build a fund balance of 10%. So how are we going to do that? It means we have to tighten our belts. We can't continue to spend every dime that comes into the district on, on everything, everything we want. We have to spend on what we need. And we have to start recognizing that there will be a recession. It's not a matter of if we'll have a recession. It's a matter of when. And so in Durango, I arrived in Durango as a superintendent right before the recession hit. I was fortunate because the board before me and the superintendent before me had built a 20% recession. I was fortunate in that when the recession hit, we didn't cut art, we didn't cut music, we didn't cut physical education at the elementary schools. We were one of the few districts on that side of the mountain that didn't because we could, we could spin down fund balance for a few years while the budget stabilization factor shrunk over time. We're in a position as a district that if recession hit next year, we as a district and as a community are going to have to make some very difficult decisions. And so I need our community to understand that we have to be willing to make some difficult decisions if that were to happen. But we're also going to have to make some decisions to begin setting aside some money so that we don't have to put ourselves in that position. So I appreciate the board's willingness. Now, we came to the board and said, how about in four years, and the board said, that's probably too aggressive. And they said, OK, let's, let's do five. And you know what? And if we can't do five, let's work towards it. And so the board has said, you know, if we're moving in that direction and we've got greater priorities like we need buses or we need white fleet, let's just show that we're moving in the right direction. So I do appreciate the board's realistic look at that. The other thing we did was we created a capital reserve fund. And so it's easy to say we're going to prioritize capital needs and infrastructure. It's another thing to say, let's set aside money. But oh, well, we really need this. So well, we'll just use that money right now. We created a capital reserve fund. And that's a one-way movement of money. So when we move money to the capital reserve fund, it doesn't come out. So it's not a fund, kind of like Social Security should be, where you don't move money to Social Security and then you take it out to, to spend on other things. When we move money to the Capital Reserve Fund, it stays there. So we moved $750,000 this year to the Capital Reserve Fund. We set aside the money for the bus purchase. And it won't come out this year because we aren't getting the buses out of this budget year. And the good news is, when we do get them in, in July, we have the money to pay for them. 
So we don't have to worry next year like, oh gosh, now we've got to figure out where we're going to pay for them. We have the money there. So, so money goes into that capital reserve fund and we have it. We put $200,000 additional money in for those boilers and those unexpected capital reserve issues so that we now have money to do those unexpected capital investment infrastructure needs. And our intention is to continue to make those committed fund movements so that we can begin building that fund so that when we have those needs, we have money to do it. Now, 200,000 is not enough, but it was a start. It was more than we've done in the past, and we have to begin making that commitment. And so, again, small baby step, but we've built the structure so that we can begin trying to address that issue within our district. Let's talk a little about staff retention and attraction. So there are a lot of things that lead to people wanting to stay in a district, and, and that's definitely no argument. We've had great people who have been here for a long time, and we paid a lot less. So please hear me say that. I know people have been critical of, of saying, you know, well, it's not all about pay, and they're absolutely right. There are people who have been here in this district for 25, 30 years, and God bless them. They love your kids, and they've been here, and we should thank them every day for that. But when you look at the salaries comparison between Elizabeth School District and the three closest school districts to us, outside of going um, out on the plains, you see the challenge we face for a young teacher who's trying to survive in this world. We, right now, are at a starting pay of 40,000. And that just changed. We were at 37,000 last year. We boosted our salaries this year, thanks to Dr. Dallas and, and the team before I arrived, to 40,000 this year. Douglas County is at 50,182 because they just passed their mill levy. And Cherry Creek is at 58,000 starting pay. And Aurora is at $51,394. Why is that? They have passed additional mill levies in their community to the tune of 21% over the base per pupil revenues that the state requires we collect, 25% in Cherry Creek and 25% in Aurora. And so they've gone to their taxpayers and said, may we levy additional tax money for education? We have 6% on top of what we're allowed to collect. And so the reality is, is we, are, we have done what we can up till now. We've done what we can with our teacher salaries. So that's why we pay what we do. Now we're going to see what we can do more of. So we have engaged um, a group of teachers. Now this is our scale. Our scale right now is based on college credits, how many, what, what degree a teacher has, how many college credits beyond that degree, whether they've achieved a master's, how many more college credits they have beyond the master's. This is very common in the education world across the country. So this is not very different if you look at school districts across the country. All right, so a teacher who comes right out of college with a bachelor's degree, the first column is kind of where they end up. And the most they can make is $55,000. And to get more money in education, they have to go back to college. And they have to find more college credits, and then they can make little movement. They can, so if they go back and they get 10 more credits and they pay those for those college credits, they have to go back Sometimes they have to take out loans to get those college credits, and they can move from 40,000 to 40,894 for those 10 credits. So that's how they move in public education. All right? We are, have been working with our licensed compensation committee. We have 19 teachers 
who stepped up in October to begin working to say, is there anything else out there? And so we began working to say, what else is out there? And so we looked at a variety of different systems. And one of the systems that our teachers looked at was a system that I was involved in. It was a system that was developed with Colorado Education Association, the State Teachers Union, with Durango teachers um, in 2016, which said college credits are great, but there's also more that teachers do than just college credits that should be taken into, into account um, in how teachers move. And so our teachers actually got excited about that. And so they began looking at that and saying, how could we make that work for us? And so we worked for four months on that. They put it together, they made it theirs, they looked at what, how does that work here in Elizabeth. They took it out to their colleagues. In December, they did a survey, they got feedback from their colleagues. They came back in December and they massaged it more. They changed the plan further. And then they put together a final plan. And then it went back out to teachers uh, last week. And teachers then um, have voted on it and said, do we like it or do we not? And is there any last minute changes? So I want to kind of outline what their plan is at this point. So there's four key objectives to the plan that they put together. The first, first objective is this. Everyone will do better in this compensation plan, regardless of where they are in their career, whether they're new to the profession, whether they're middle of the career, or whether they're thinking about retiring in the next few years. Everyone will do better, and they've actually outlined what that looks like that it empowers employees to move. So right now, the only two ways teachers can move on the system is by surviving and coming back or by going and paying for college credits. It's the only way teachers can move on the system. There's no other way. There's no way to accelerate on the system. Survival and go get college credits, that's it. This system allows them to move through other means so they can accelerate on the system and they're empowered to do so. It puts them in a more competitive position to neighboring districts. So a teacher with a bachelor's degree can actually catch teachers with a master's degree in this system. So I'm not capped out. I'm not capped out at the $50,000 mark. If I'm a bachelor's, if I'm a teacher with a bachelor's degree, I can actually move further on the scale. So I'm more competitive now in the system. I'm not necessarily having to go back to get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree to actually be competitive. And it does put us in a position to potentially at some point go to our, our community and say, like Douglas County, like Cherry Creek, like Aurora, community, would you be willing to invest in us? Would you be willing to contribute something more to make our pay scale even better? I personally am not sure our community cares if our teachers have master's degrees. I'm just going to be frank. I think our, our community loves our teachers. They love the fact that they love our kids. They love the fact that they do so much for our kids. That's what I believe our community cares about. I've not had anyone in our community say, how many of our teachers have a master's degree? How many of our teachers have more credits than just a bachelor's degree? I've never had someone ask me that. Doesn't mean that there's not someone out there who cares, but that's not something anyone's ever asked. But I do believe this system actually does prepare us, and I believe our teachers think that it does prepare us for more community support. And it is sustainable within our current funding. So it does put us in a position of moving teachers even further than that starting pay of 40,000, and it is sustainable within our current funding system. So here's what the scale looks like. The first five years of a teacher's career is kind of a make or break time for teachers. Research says that in the first five years, 40% of teachers leave the profession. It's the hardest time of, of a teacher's career because 
they are trying to learn their craft, they're trying to learn to manage kids, they're trying to learn to instruct, they're trying to learn to engage kids, they're trying to, all of those things about a teacher's craft is just difficult. And so those first five years, we're saying teachers get that automatic movement. Every time you come back, you're getting that $1,000. We're not asking you to do anything more than just continue to improve your craft. So it's automatic movement in those first five years. For, uh, whoops, I'm sorry. I've got the wrong scale there. It starts at 43. <laughs> I, I, yeah, that would be great, right? That's what they deserved. I'm gonna skip over to a different PowerPoint. Somehow I screwed up and in shifting over, I ended up with the wrong scale on that one. I apologize tremendously. I would love that to be their scale. That's the scale they deserve. So that's the scale. So that's the teacher scale. So they start at 43, they move to 44, 45, 46, 47. That's automatic scale for teachers. When they get to phase two, that's when they take control of their earnings. So the first five years is automatic movement. We're not telling teachers they have to do anything extra. They don't have to mentor others. They don't have to take additional professional development. They can, they don't have to. We want them to perfect their craft. When they get into phase two, that's when they can earn additional movement based upon their contributions to their school, their district, or their community through additional professional development, through additional college credits, through additional leadership opportunities, through things they do in their community, through committees they choose to be on, anything they do. If they do want to go get their master's, they can, and they actually get more credit in this system than they do in the current system. If they want to go get their master's in chemistry because it makes them a better chemistry teacher, they actually get more advancement in this system than they do in the other system. So this system, when they get 100 points, they move $3,500, not 834 like the other one did, but they move $3,500. This system, they may not move every year. So it's a little different mindset shift. So you don't move $834 every year, which is only $60 a month. They move $3,500 a year. And so in this system, it's about lifelong earnings, and they have that ability of moving up to 79,000. So it's a higher uh, level of earnings for them in their career, and they have control over it. And so let me shift back to the other PowerPoint. Sorry for that confusion. And I will let you see the difference in that lifelong earnings. So when I said it's better for every employee, so this is a current teacher on our current scale. So our current scale has an $834 advancement every year. So I'm a teacher, I come back next year. Again, remember the only way to move is coming back or getting college credits. So I come back next year, I get $834. That's, that's movement. I come back next year, I get $834. I come back next year, I get $834. I come back next year, I get $834. I got 10 more college credits, may have gone into debt for that. Um, I moved up to a BA plus 20 credits. I was on a BA plus 10 credits here. So I got a, an additional $1,000 plus a step, and I kept moving, $834, $834, $834, $834, 10 year earnings is $499,000. On this new system, I started at step five, $47,000, 48, 48, this is, this is the typical movement for a teacher. This particular teacher is someone who isn't, isn't earning points. Let me explain that. So movement is based upon points, and you get points based upon what you're doing. 
So for a teacher who may not have time to be in leadership positions, for teachers who may not have time to take additional professional development, for teachers who may not have time to be on additional committees, their points are probably going to be based upon their required professional development. Their points may be based upon other things that they do during the day that they are earning points for, but they may not earn a lot of voluntary points if they are moms with lots of kids who have soccer and dance and those things that they have to lock their room up at the end of the day and leave. They may have aging parents they have to take care of. That's what employee number one exemplifies. So that employee may not have as much movement as, say, the next two employees. That employee is still earning more during the 10-year period than the one on our current system, $517,500. Employee two is someone who's able to maybe take on a department chair, maybe do a voluntary professional development during the year. They're earning some additional points. That employee is making a little more movement during the year. You see their earnings is a little higher, $538,000 during the year. This employee is actually doing a little more. They might be on DAC, they might be on PTCO, they might be taking on some additional voluntary re uh, responsibility. You'll see their movement is a little more. Their 10-year earnings is 545,000. So again, they are empowered to move on the pay scale. And so that's the system that our Teacher License Compensation Committee has developed. It's gone out to our staff. Right now our staff is about 78%. Yes, we want to move forward. We aren't saying, woohoo, let's do it. Our License Compensation Committee is coming back together on Tuesday to look at the 28% who said, not sure yet because we want to see what is it that maybe there's still some concerns about, because maybe there are things that we still need to modify. And so we're not quite there yet. We're still going to see, are there some things that we need to do? Because we do want to make sure that we try to make this the best system that it can be before it goes to our board for adoption. So I do want to just real quickly cover what causes advancement based on this plan. Longevity, teachers, every year they come back, they get additional points. So for doing nothing, just coming back, they're getting points. So points come for a teacher just returning. Leadership, I'm mentoring others, I'm on building leadership team, I'm uh, 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 working with a uh, brand new teacher, I'm, um, of course, these things aren't going to come to me tonight. Um, anything that, that I'm contributing to others within my building, knowledge and skill, I'm taking professional development, I'm going and taking a college class. The difference in this system is a college class has to be pre-approved. We want teachers to take college classes that are going to help them in their uh, assignment. Colleges have done some really creative things for teachers because of the old system. They have created some very easy master's pathways so that a teacher can go get a master's so they can make more money, but it does nothing to improve their, class, their, their, their classroom skill. And so we want to make sure that teachers who go back to college really are getting something that's going to improve their skill set, and our teachers want to do that. And so there's a pre-approval process for teachers who want to go back to college. Uh, outside professional development, same thing. Teachers would get those pre-approved. Certifications, teachers want to go get additional certifications. Those lead to points. Committees, DAC, SAC, Curriculum Review Committee, all of those committees are additional points. Community involvement, Education Foundation, teachers who want to serve on Education Foundation, why aren't they getting points? They're representing their district, they're representing their school. Those are things that we want to make sure teachers who are doing those things after school, they're getting um, represented, they're, they're getting points for those. Performance, our teachers say, we don't want a performance pay plan, but when I rock it, when my kids soar, when they get high levels of achievement, why can't I be recognized with points that cause me to elevate in my 
um, compensation. That's something they wanted, that's in the plan. And then clubs and sponsorships are not for the uh, clubs here at the high school where we've got a, a play being prepared here where teachers are working 20 hours a week uh, additional to their jobs. These are clubs like the math clubs at elementary schools where teachers are staying two hours uh, two days a week with kids who are struggling with math and they're doing a math club to get kids excited about math. That's this type of club. The, the, the um, drama club, the, those things that are additional jobs, those are gonna be paid after school, band, marching band, those are not this type of a club. These are clubs that are related to the teacher's daily jobs um, that they might choose to get points for instead of being compensated. Couple more things in this, I'll try to expedite here. Retirement track. Teachers often work really hard and then they disappear. We wanna honor teachers in this district. We have a couple of teachers who are thinking about retiring here in the district. They walk out the door and we lose some massive knowledge. We have an engineering teacher. If they walk out the door tomorrow, we lose engineering for our kids. Think about that. There's no one to, no one to pick up those classes, no one to teach them next year. So this gives us the ability of a teacher saying, I'm gonna retire in a couple of years. They can enter a retirement track. You might have noticed those three high pay scales at the bottom. They can enter a retirement track, enter into an agreement with us. During those, that retirement track time where they're earning some higher pay, they will package their curriculum. They will work with a teacher who's going to take over their classes when they leave. They will ensure that all of their materials are packaged so that that class continues when they leave. So retirement track is really a chance for someone to make sure that their program continues. They leave their legacy. Um, so retirement track is an application. It's an option for someone to uh, uh, apply it gives us some time to know that they're leaving, gives us a chance to prepare, and it's a chance for us to honor them. It can be a one, two, or a three year plan. And again, it is an option. It's not something we have to approve, it's some, something we can. It is a sustainable plan. Um, it is something the board will commit to a certain amount of our budget that will be set aside for salaries. Um, and that means in a year that we don't need as much, the extra money will be set aside so that when we have more teachers move, that money will be there to make sure that we cover the additional movement for our teachers. Um, and we will also need to be very careful that we don't overstaff because when we overstaff, obviously then it makes it very hard to ensure that we can uh, support this salary plan. We do believe that this is a plan that our community will consider uh, supporting with some additional funds at some point in the future, that we do believe that if we went to our community and said, would you support uh, potentially a mill levy at some point, that our community might say yes to something like this versus uh, I'm gonna pay you more for a master's, de master's degree than you for a bachelor's degree. Um, that's something we'll begin a conversation at some point in the future. Um, but we do believe that it's something that has a better shot than what we currently have. We've begun a conversation. As you know, we're struggling to hire bus drivers. Um, we are in early stages. We also have a committee of uh, classified staff who are looking at their plan. We have uh, a wonderful pay plan that gives our classified staff members a 20 cent pay raise every year. Woohoo! Um, we are shifting that to a 2% pay increase, which is about 40 to 50 cent pay raises each year. We are market analyzing those. We pay drastically under. Our cooks who cook for your children at lunchtime um, are way under our McDonald's cooks down the road. Uh, that is sad. We're not paying our classified staff members anywhere compared to their market comparable jobs in the community. We are currently working to analyze all of our jobs and compare them against similar jobs in the community, and we intend to change that uh, this year. We will then divide our jobs into thirds and make sure that every year we analyze a third of them to make sure that we stay on top of that, that we never let our jobs fall this far behind our market comparable jobs. Um, they will also have a retirement track. So we don't, want our, we don't want three of our bus drivers to surprise us at the end of the year and say, we're retiring. We've already lost a few routes that we can't staff 
Uh, we've had to tell parents, sorry, we can't transport your kids. They're going to have to walk across 86 to Running Creek because we don't have enough drivers to transport kids. If we had three bus drivers surprise us tomorrow and say, I'm leaving at the end of the year, we'd have other routes that we could not transport. So we want a retirement track so we can encourage our support staff to give us more notice, allow us a better chance to prepare uh, for the departure of some of our staff when they reach that retirement age. And so we're going to work really hard on this compensation plan for them as well. Um, so this is a plan also that's in its early stages, again, being developed by our uh, support staff. Um, and this is going out to our staff for their feedback at this time as well. So let's talk about what matters to many of our parents, our school performance. Elizabeth schools do an amazing job. Our schools are high performing. They always have been. So congratulations to our teachers here who really have rocked it for many years. And we know that's why. We have amazing teachers in this district. And I can say after 38 years of public education, I walk around our classrooms and we've got amazing teachers in this district. Um, at times, we've had schools that have slipped behind. We've had schools who have dropped back in performance levels. And you know what? They always step it up and they figure out what's happening and they get themselves back. We have these four performance levels that the state ranks us. Um, right now, all of our schools are in performance. Last year, we had a school drift back. They didn't stay there very long. They went right back into the performance category. This year, at the mid-level, mid-year mark, all of our schools uh, are uh, exceeding where they should be at the mid-year mark. So again, for parents who are like, how are our kids doing? Uh, we have a few grade levels where they didn't hit that mark, and our principals in those teams have already said, OK, here's what we're doing to make sure that by the end of the year, we're back on track. But when you look at our overall average, all of our schools have exceeded that. Our curriculum, the challenge is we moved as school districts away from the adoption of curriculum. If you remember, parents, we used to, when we were in school, we used to have those years where we would get those new books. Oh, this is when we got our new readers or we got our new math books. We haven't done that for years in public education. We've left our schools to find their own resources. We've left. Uh, our, our schools haven't been given resources, and our teachers haven't been given resources. Our teachers have had to find their own. And that's really unfair to them. Um, and that's not just in our schools, but in many schools. Um, and so that's been a challenge for our teachers. Again, the days of uh, textbook adoptions have gone. And we, we really have to get back to that. This year, we moved both of our elementary schools onto the same math and language arts curriculums. Uh, both of our elementaries currently use the CKLA, or the Core Knowledge Language Arts Curriculum, and the iReady Mathematics Program. Both of our schools, for the first time, train together in uh, Core Knowledge and iReady Math. Um, at the beginning of the year, we brought them together, and they trained together, which was exciting. Um, we also um, had our uh, middle school actually have a formal math program. A couple of years ago, our middle school principal, um, right in the midst of, uh, of um, uh, COVID, brought in a math program that was free. It was not a, a formal adopted program, but he brought in math material because his staff at that point in time was trying to scrape together math material. We did adopt Zern Math this year and became a, a anchor school in the state. That is a material that was provided by the state, which was great. We appreciate the state doing that, but we became an anchor school, so we had some additional training. Uh, Zern is designed to prioritize uh, direct instruction um, and does have an electronic supports component. I know when I was interviewed, I had parents who expressed a deep concern about too much electronic component in our math programs. And so I know that's something as a school district we're trying to determine how do we, how do we get back to some more direct math instruction? And that'll be something we'll be working on at the beginning of next school year. Um, 
it does have a 90 minute a week, so it's not, it's not all electronic, 90 minutes a week, uh, three lessons uh, online in the Zern program. Um, we are engaged in a final uh, step of a math, or early, I'm sorry, elementary and middle school science adoption. Um, that's actually tomorrow. Our elementary and middle school uh, science teachers will be making a final selection of a science uh, curriculum resource. So we're excited finally to be able to give them a science resource. We've had three different programs that they've been reviewing uh, since the beginning of the year, and they'll finally be coming together to make that selection. We also are deconstructing our science and social studies, our science, uh, sorry, our social studies standards slow down, Dan, uh, to provide increased levels of transparency and clarity, not only to our teachers, but also to our uh, students and parents. Social studies are pretty complex, and so we've been trying to really go through our social studies standards um, and help our teachers really prioritize. So many of our state standards are so complex, and if you were to teach all of our standards, you would need probably a year and a half per grade level to teach all of them. And so we're really trying to help our teachers recognize we have to prioritize the standards and say what are the most important standards that our kids need to know so that our kids can maximize their time in the classroom. And so sometimes we forget that. If, if our standards have become so complex in the state of Colorado, it is very challenging to make sure that our students learn all of them. At the high school, our major focus is really around career and technical education. Um, we are continuing to increase the career and technical education options we have here. Um, our auto shop, everyone always says, what's happening? We've got all the materials out there. Our auto shop um, state permit was denied. Uh, we submitted the materials that our contractor thought was necessary to get the state permit. Um, we were denied. We needed more architectural drawings. Those have been resubmitted, my understanding, on Friday to the state. We are working to apply pressure to the state to get those through the approval process, hoping that we will get final approval here in the spring so that the ground can be broken and that building can be constructed. Once that happens, we are hopeful that that building will be constructed and ready to have our classes move in at the start of next year. With that, we had to delay our construction trades class. That was supposed to start in, the, um, uh, in January of this year. That was going to move into the portable where our um, auto class is currently functioning. Um, that will now start in the fall of 2024. Um, we continue to look at other interests. So if you know of other things that our students are interested in, remember we have CNA, we have robotics, we have computer applications, we have lots of career and technical ed programs in our school. Um, we want to continue to expand those because we do believe that our students find that to be what attracts them, things that give them real career opportunities uh, when they leave school. So we want to continue to, to, to explore those. One of the things that we're finding though is that we here at Elizabeth Middle School are finding more and more students have less need to come to school because they meet their graduation requirements. And one of the conversations we've been having with our administration here is, a student meets their, their graduation requirements, but we have these career and technical education programs. So how do we excite students about taking classes even if they don't need them? I mean, if we have classes, if we have concurrent enrollment classes, if a student doesn't need it, but they can get college credit, how do we get kids excited about, I don't need it to graduate, but I can save my mom and dad some money if I got these college credits. And I know not every kid wants to go to college, but we really need to think about how to shift that thinking of, I don't need it, so I'm gonna stay home, versus 
wow, I got these cool things I can do. I can learn auto mechanics. I can learn this. I can learn that. So just a little tease of, of things that we are trying to think about of how can we shift that thinking of I've got eight periods a day, but I don't need to come. But there are some cool things that I could be doing at school. And how, how can we shift that thinking? We are also in the process of, of talking about a multi-district online. So we've submitted an application. And that multi-district online school has some online career opportunities that will be available to our students. So there are some online career education classes that we don't have available here at school um, because we are sponsoring that program. Those classes will become available to our students. So just because we can't offer that class here by a live teacher here, those courses will become available to our students. So instead of a student saying, well, gosh, I can't take it because we don't have it, our students could go to a computer lab here and now take these classes. And so one of the things you'll note about our philosophy here in Elizabeth that our board has embraced is let's make sure we offer a variety of options. One size doesn't fit all for our kids. Um, a traditional bricks and mortar school may not be the right fit for every student in Elizabeth. We have homeschool programs. We have traditional schools that we believe are great. We have a great charter school legacy. Why not continue to expand some choices and options so that children who may learn differently can continue to find those choices? And so that on online school, we hope, will be one more choice. Um, and even for kids here at our schools, could find something within those options um, that hopefully will be helpful. Our instructional focus is something that's really important because we can have great curriculum, but if it's not delivered well in the classroom, then it's really all for naught. And so good curriculum is only as good as its delivery. And so we are really focused on how do we increase our ability to deliver that more effectively. And so our instructional focus has really been around learning targets, has been around curriculum mapping, planning, and collaboration, instructional clarity, and evaluation of learning. So just real quickly, I'll touch on those learning targets, is when kids walk into class, we really believe kids need to know what, what's, what's in store for me today. What am I going to know? Or what am I going to learn today? So one of the things we've really asked our teachers to think about is kids need to know What's, what's the plan today? What am I expected to learn? And one of the things that we've asked each school to do is really talk about, is it written on the board? Is it something that, that's spoken to kids? How do kids know what it is that's in store for me today? Curriculum mapping, we really are working hard, and this is something we want to be visible for parents. And so we've purchased a tool, and we have teachers at every school working to become trainers to eventually train their teachers at, uh, throughout their building on a tool called UCCI that will be open to parents so that you can see what's happening in the classroom. It'll be a curriculum mapping tool that you can see what's happening in the school. Where is my child now and where are they going within the unit of study? And so that's the curriculum mapping tool. And we really want to see how something starts in kindergarten, goes to first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, and how it follows through the K-12 curriculum. Planning and correct collaboration is, that, again, that vertical articulation. One of the things we really want to do a better job of is how we pass kids from grade to grade, especially from fifth grade to sixth grade, from eighth grade to ninth grade, from preschool to kindergarten. Those vertical articulations are really critical. Um, and where we have kids who struggle, what do we do about it within our curriculum? Our instructional focus, one of the things that I do when I visit schools is I visit classrooms. Every school has an instructional um, uh, feedback tool. And so we really have asked principals to talk about what is, what is, what is the instructional focus? What are the things we should see in every classroom? Um, what is common? that teachers should be expected to be doing within each of their classrooms. And finally, how do we evaluate learning in the classroom? How do we know kids really know what we set out to teach them today? And so those are the instructional focuses that we've been working on 
within our building. Safety and security, I know this is a lot, folks. Um, we watched yesterday or the day before something very scary happening in a parade. We are seeing crazy things happen in places we never imagined things happen. And certainly we've watched over the last 20 years things happen in schools. Um, we recognize that you send your kids to school and you expect them to be safe. And our board has taken that extremely seriously. We have done a lot in this past year to really try to increase the safety measures. And I'm going to tell you we're not there yet. We feel like we've done a lot, but we're going to continue to do more. This year, we've entered into an agreement with Elizabeth, School Dis or Elizabeth Police Department. Excuse me. Uh, we have two full-time school resource officers. Today was School Resource Officer Appreciation Day, by the way. Um, so we showered them with a lot of appreciation. Um, we have four highly trained armed staff members um, in our schools. Um, we have two unarmed uh, security staff within our schools as well. We are hoping to expand to three additional uh, highly trained armed staff next year so that every building will have at least a full-time armed staff member who's always within that building. Um, these are not people who are are seen. These are not people who walk around with a weapon strapped on their side. These are people who blend in. These are people who um, honestly are there to act. And I think that's really important because the, the reality is, is um, we need somebody on campus to act in case somebody comes in with the intention of causing harm. And that is, um, I think, a wise move. Unfortunately, you have schools who do things like armed teachers, and our board has not taken that position, and I appreciate that. The reality is, is in, in, in a situation where someone comes on a campus to cause harm, um, having lots of people with guns creates havoc. Um, and I know there may be people in this room who disagree with me on that. I want somebody who knows how to use it. I want no, someone who's highly trained, and I want someone who's going to be very precise. Um, because I don't want somebody innocent hurt. And so we have been very careful about that. Our armed staff are former police officers, former military officers, for people who have been highly trained and know what to do, when to do it. Um, and that's the important part for us. Um, they are regularly engaged in training. This isn't something they go to the range once a year. They are regularly trained. Um, and something that we're going to insist that they continue to do it. They're trained by SWAT trainers, um, and, and it's something that happens uh, no less than quarterly. Um, and it, it's critical that that continue to happen. So I, I do want our community to know that these aren't people that go to the range and shoot at a paper target. These are people who, who go through intensive training to ensure that they know when and how to react in an intensive situation. We do have a Raptor system. Um, the nice thing about Raptor is that every teacher um, has it on their phone. Um, right now, I could initiate, because I happen to be at Elizabeth High School, I could initiate a lockdown in this building if I chose to, because I'm in this building. If I were at home, I couldn't, because it's geocache to this building because it's, it's based on GPS. Um, because I'm in this building, it, it would allow me to, based on what I'm seeing, it would allow me to activate any incident emergency procedure. Um, it allows me to communicate with law enforcement. It allows me to communicate with others in the building. It allows me to identify who's with me. It allows me to account for my students. Um, Raptor system is amazing because it allows us to be immediately accountable. When we do drills, we use the Raptor system. Teachers can immediately report who's with them. So we can immediately account for students. So it used to be when we would go out for an emergency drill, we'd have the red and green signs. All of my students are with me or all of my students aren't. Now teachers can immediately take attendance because this links with our uh, student information system. So if I'm in third period, I immediately have all of my third period students, and I can Im immediately go and say, okay, 
these students are with me, this student's not. And so our office knows immediately which students aren't accounted for. And so it allows us to be accountable immediately in an emergency situation for which students aren't. In a lockdown situation, we immediately know which, which rooms are safe, which rooms are secure, which rooms have already been checked in. Um, and so this type of technology is, is critical for parents to know, is we're not in the situation where we don't know who's safe and, and where people are. We do, and, and I think it's important for parents to know that these things have been put into place so that we have safety measures here so that people clearly know where, where people are, who's safe, what's happening, we can communicate with each other. Um, all of our radios in our district have a red button. That red button allows us to bridge. So here in this building, a red button allows them to immediately bridge with central office with our director of safety and security who happens to be a former Secret Service agent. Our radios have the ability to bridge directly to first responders. First responders have the ability of bridging to our radios. So we have the ability of interoperability um, between all of our agencies responding uh, to the scene. And that's new. I mean, that's something that's, that's just started this year. And I think that's powerful. It's no longer do we have to call and hope that the cell phone towers are working. What happens in an emergency? What do your kids do the minute something happens? They're on the phone with you. Well, we have 900 kids in this building trying to call what happens to the cell tower that happens to be mounted on our water tower across the street. It's jammed. We're trying to call first responders. We can't. Now we have a radio. We can talk to them directly. And so we, we, we feel very fortunate in Elizabeth because of the technology and the partnership that we've built with our first responders. Our first responders are here. So I know sometimes parents get freaked out. Oh my God, there's police cars in front of the school or the fire, fire trucks are out in front of the school. It's probably because we're doing a drill. Because anytime we do a drill, they come. They come because they want to be here when we're doing it. They want to work with us. They want to give us feedback. Um, when we do a fire drill, they'll block a door. They'll come in intentionally and block a door because they don't want to do a drill and, and have it just be a normal drill. They want to make sure the kids have that ability to say, oh, wow, that door is blocked. What do I do? Because guess what? In a real situation, that door could be blocked. And so. Our first responders are major partners of the Elizabeth School District, and that's what makes us, I think, more effective in the safety and security measures that we have. Safe to tell is really a critical tool, and I hope you as parents know that. Um, safe to tell is something that we respond to 24-7, and we have hundreds of safe to tell reports 24-7. Our director of safety and security, middle of the night, weekends, is responding to safe to tell reports. We get a report on bullying, suicide, concerns. Um, there are all types of reports, school threats that come in. They are not, we'll get to it Monday morning, they're, re they're reacted to immediately. Um, police dispatch gets it, we get it, district gets it, school administration gets it, counselors get it. And when we get it, we, we react. We immediately check on students. We immediately provide first responders contact information. We make sure that it's acted upon because I would rather check on a student and find everything's fine than ignore it and find that we missed. I can tell you in Durango as superintendent, I can tell you there are 10 children that are alive because of Safe to Tell. Um, and I can tell you there were probably 90 children that we checked on that it was a false alarm. But I will take 90 false alarms to save 10 children um, than to say, you know, sorry, 90 parents who we knocked on your door and, and we bothered you and your kid was fine, uh, than to have those 10 children not be here today. So really know that safe to tell is important. And so if you have a concern or your child says, hey, I'm really worried about Bobby, he said something today, 
please remember, Safe to Tell is a great resource for you. I'm going to tell you I'm really concerned about a trend I'm seeing. I am seeing some really deep concern about things of, uh, like discrimination and harassment that's surfacing here in the last several months. Um, comments racially motivated, comments uh, of harassment, um, not only in our kids, but also in our community. Last night we had to have a parent removed from a basketball game for a racial slur towards a, a referee. I'm seeing kids that are harassing each other. I'm seeing parents who are harassing kids. Um, this, is, this is a challenge as a community we need to take on. Um, it's not a kid problem. It's a, it's a community challenge, and we have to step up. Um, we, we, we need to begin to, to figure out a way to, to overcome that. Um, we had a conversation on Tuesday with our principals. There's so much pride in this school and in our middle school. Cardinal pride is big. And we have started to challenge our kids here. If, if Cardinal pride is, is, is what you're about, how do you turn Cardinal pride into stopping that? When someone makes a statement that is unacceptable, that, that's, that's about color, about sexual orientation, how do you stop it? How do you as a school say, unacceptable? That's not what Cardinals are about. Because until as students, as a community, we change it, it's not going to stop. And so I really want to ask you as parents to help us. Um, like I said, when it happens at a, a basketball game and it's a parent and we have to eject the parent from the game, we gotta, we gotta do something about it. And so please think about that. Safe to Tell is, is reporting it. Um, we can punish kids, we can suspend them. It's not changing it. It's not, it's not, it's not getting to the root of the problem. And so we really need to, we need your help in trying to get to that. So. Probably hard to move on to the next topic, but I'm going to do that, and we'll we'll take questions at the end, and maybe talk more about that. We we are facing a major challenge with growth. <clears throat> we've got heavy growth happening in our community. We've got projections: a high growth of 1,100 students over the next seven years. Uh, 700 students is middle projections, and 463 growth, and most of that's in the middle and elementary grades. Um, the reality is, is we need another school. We've done a master plan. Master plan says we need a bond. Master plan is, says we need to build an elementary or a preschool site to relieve our elementary schools of preschool. We've got four preschool classrooms at both elementary schools. If we could relieve those, we could add more elementary uh, classrooms at those sites. Um, we really should remodel our middle school. Our middle school has capacity, but they don't have lunchroom capacity. We'd have to serve lunch from 9 to 2 to actually use every classroom at the middle school. I don't think middle schoolers want to eat that long. Um, they also have major safety issues at the middle school. If you haven't noticed as a parent, if you get buzzed in at that middle school, you walk by three hallways of kids before you ever are seen by the office. Luckily, we do have an amazing security guard there um, who is more often than not watching that front door. Uh, but again, heaven forbid he's called away or he's working with someone and somebody gets buzzed in, there's always that risk. So we do have some major safety issues at the middle school and it is our oldest plant right now that really does need some improvements. We also believe that this high school we know this high school is built as a college-going school, and our community is not a college-going community. We got less of our kids going to college than most communities in the state of Colorado. And so we really do need more rooms that are flexible rooms to do more CTE classrooms. They recommend a new central office. That's the least of my concern, to be very honest with you. So um, I would not worry about that. The cost of that bond would be 500 to $639 per household. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I don't think that's going to pass. I don't know how it would. Um, if anyone in here wants to 
get that passed for me, I'd appreciate it. But um, our taxpayers just experienced a uh, roughly 50% tax valuation increase. And so I'm left with a challenge in that I've got to get a school built, and I don't know how I'm going to do that. And I can admire the problem and cram kids into classrooms and get you very angry at me, or I can find a solution. So. Um, the reality is, is I've got to find a solution. So I'm going to share a possible solution, and I'm going to ask you for some feedback as a community. Um, this is our current community right now. Most of the growth right now is happening up here. Look at where all of our, our majority of our schools are down here. <laughs> We've got Running Creek that still has some capacity, although they have really odd-shaped rooms. Who built triangular-shaped rooms in a school? I'd like to have their heads examined, but it's a little late. Um, obviously, our high school and our middle school across the street from each other. Legacy is expanding. They have some space. Um, they didn't meet their enrollment projections this year. So they actually have some capacity, but they're expanding. So they would be happy to take some more kids, but they right now they're not where the growth is happening up here. So the, the growth is up here. Singing Hills is at their functional capacity. At the beginning of this year, they had one functional seat left. Um, and, and frankly, um, I believe that was more than taken this year. Independence is where I'm about to show you kind of their community. So Independence, this area is built out. Um, I believe this is the next area. Um, Shelly, you can probably correct me. I think you live here. Um, I think this is maybe the next area that will be built. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. And up here a little more. So, and then this is future construction. This is a school site that's been dedicated to us. Um, and this is kind of a drawing of, of that area. It's not necessarily, this isn't exactly what it will be, but this is kind of their projection of what it will be. Um, this is an elementary school site. Um, it could be a middle school. They, they're open to whatever it would be. It's about a 25-acre site. Um, uh, they're open to it being an early childhood center as well, if we wanted it to be. Uh, talk to them a little about maybe doing an early childhood center. This is Delbert Road, although there is talk about maybe Delbert Road somehow swinging down here because there is a hill. And I think for visibility's sake, um, last I talked to the developer, there is thought that maybe Delbert Road may come in a little more, may swing somehow into the development. Um, and so this is the most likely school site that would be developed. Um, again, if we go back to this, um, these are developments right now. This is another uh, craft development being proposed. I think that's four or five years down the road. I don't think it's anything that's within the near future. Um, this would be down the road. We do have a school site up here in Sun Country. It's a 40-acre high school site. Um, this, the developer is proposing another elementary and high, a middle school future site here. Um, we don't have any other land um, in the district um, right now other than the independent site. So that is, that is where we have. Again, without a bond, I can't build a school. And, and so that's kind of the, the, the challenge I'm facing. One option we have, and I'm just going to share this because I, like I said, I'm trying to find a solution, is to consider a partnership with a charter school. Um, one of the things I'm not a fan of is forcing people into a charter school. And so um, I would not want to build a charter school in Independence and say, well, you live there, you have to go there. And so one of the things that we are exploring right now, um, anyone who has been by Walmart at dismissal or arrival time knows that Legacy is a mess with uh, the fact that all of their parents have to drop off and pick up. And so we right now are, ex are exploring if we can assist with transporting children to Legacy. Um, that, would, that would be our first foray into transporting children to a charter school. Um, that would allow us to relieve some of that community congestion um, that would allow us to uh, hopefully provide some relief to that. 
if we partnered with a charter school up in the independence community and the, and the developer has said, yes, we would grant you that land, it's dedicated, meaning we don't own that land, it's not deeded to us, the developer would have to give us that land under the condition of letting us have it for a charter school. Um, we would have to then be committed to say, if you want to go to that charter school, we'll transport you. Um, so we would not have to say you have to live there to go there. So if you lived in the Running Creek community and you wanted to go, we would transport you. If you lived at Singing Hills and you wanted to go, we would transport you. Um, we wouldn't force you to go there. So that would allow relief anywhere in the, in the district to, to go there. Um, that would provide some relief wherever in the community um, so that, again, we wouldn't force you to go. And then independents would still be able to, to, to go to any other school so that, again, families who want a traditional school uh, could go to traditional school. Um, it would allow us to have a school built because like Legacy, Legacy was built. It's a beautiful school facility. It didn't cost the taxpayer an additional dime. They built their own school. A charter school can go out and get a traditional mortgage. We can't. A school district cannot go finance a building. We have to get taxpayer approval through a bond. So that's the difference in what a charter school can do and what a public school district can't. So this is the only option I see right now, unless somebody can bring forward some other way of us building a traditional uh, school. I do believe it would be critical that we not force families there. We are exploring what model that would be. Um, legacy has said, gosh, we'd love to build another legacy. Well, I don't know that our community needs another legacy. It's legacy is a great school, but I, I don't know that just another legacy. I'd like to find another model that our community would like. And so as I've shared in my communications, I've had families say I'd like to to, uh, classical schools. So we're doing a workshop in two weeks to see if that's really what people want. People throw out terms, but I don't know if they really know what a classical school is. So we're doing a workshop in two weeks to see if that's really what people want. If they don't want a classical school, we'll see is there some other school they want. So we're going to do a classical school workshop, um, and then we'll see if it, you know what whether that's an option. Um, a charter school again could go out and float a mortgage, build a, build a school there, and then we could hopefully um, in 2025 actually be able to begin relieving that growth um, within our community. So we're hopeful that that might be an option our community is open to. I'd again love to hear when we get to Q&A if that's something that you feel like makes sense. We still have other capital needs, so let's talk a little about that. Um, the middle school is probably my biggest concern. In Durango, we did apply for some safety grants, and I believe the middle school is one that we could go after a safety grant for. We really need to build a secure vestibule, which would be basically a new office at the front of the high school, or at the front of the middle school. That would allow us to take the current office and actually expand the cafeteria. So we would need to, Remember talking about capital improvement fund? We would need to, over the next couple of years, move money into that capital improvement fund until we saved up enough to be able to do some renovation of the office, hopefully get a, capital, get a safety grant to actually build an office up at the front where we could move our front office to the front, a secure vestibule where parents would come in, be checked in, talk to the office, and then be able to access the school if they needed to get in. So that, that is my suggestion on the middle school. Um, obviously, there's some other things. We have some air conditioning units that need to be replaced there. We're going to have to find a way to start putting away money to be able to, to begin staggering and planning some of that improvement at the middle school. The other thing we could do is if we decided we could get the community to do a small mill levy, we did one in 2017 that was successful. If we could get the community to say, we are willing to do a small mill levy, a $12 a month mill levy that could help us move our salary scale up a little further, be more competitive with our neighboring districts, maybe set aside $500,000 a month for capital improvements, we could begin checking off some of these capital improvement projects. And so that would be, potentially something else we could
begin working towards. Frontier Center, we all are almost near the end, I promise, folks. Uh, Frontier Center, people have said what's happening there. We have taken it off the market. Um, it is currently um, uh, the old parking lot across the street is currently in the process of being sold. It's been a slow process. Um, the proceeds from that, we've sold it for $250,000 for a little parking lot. That was a pretty good deal. Um, that money will be reinvested back into Frontier. It's currently being used for homeschool programs. 140 children are being served in that building. We're pretty excited about that. Um, we may relocate our offices there. We're, we've slowed that down a little bit. We had some plumbing problems that actually were just fixed yesterday. Um, we found a pipe that broke under the stairs. So if you drive by there, you'll see that the stairs in the front were dug up. We actually found an elbow that went down before it hit the sewer pipe at the street that broke. That's been repaired. So we now have uh, the plumbing fixed there. Um, we had one bank of bathrooms working, but all the others were backed up. So um, that's now been repaired. So um, we may relocate our district offices there. Our online school may be located there if that gets approved. Um, we have some community groups. Baby Bear Hugs works out of there right now. We've had the American Legion use it for their food collection. So it is being used, um, but right now we're excited that it's still a community icon. It's still uh, an asset to our community. And we do hope the gym will be used. The Parks and Rec would love to get gym used more frequently. Last thing I'd like to talk about is declining parent involvement and also parent rights. In my 38 years in, in public education, I can say that I've seen parents become less and less involved. And I also know that in our world, parents have become more and more busy. We've had to take on more jobs. Parents have, you know, the ability for a parent to stay home, just our economy doesn't allow that. Um, but I've also seen that we've asked you less and less to become involved. And I think one of the things that we as a school district really have tried to do, and I think our board has really tried to do, is to say, you know, we want you to be more involved. And I hope you'll hear that more and more from us. Um, we've stated very clearly that we want you to be in charge of instilling the values in your children. We don't want to instill values in your children. We want you to. And we're going to respect what you send your children to school with, and we're not going to change that. And so that's very important to us. Our board chose to take, I think, a very balanced approach to parents' Bill of Rights. There are districts across the country who have gone very radical and said, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Our board did not. Our board took a very balanced approach. There's another district in the Springs who said, let's just outline everywhere in our board policies that says, here's what parents have the right to do, and here's what your responsibilities are. And so if you want to see that, it's in our board policy manual, policy KBB. Um, and that's really important that you know that our board is not saying, you know, you know, can't do this and you can't do that and, and the district won't do this and the district cannot, can't do that. The board has not taken that position. And so please understand that our board really wants to, you to know that we respect your right as a parent and we're going to make sure you raise your children and we're going to make sure we stay out of your way. Um, really, we want you to have that responsibility. I'm going to give you an example of something that we've been doing. Um, there's a lot of talk across Colorado, and there's even a bill in, in the state legislature about libraries. There are um, boards, sorry, Jason, <laughs> there, are, there are boards who are banning books in libraries. Uh, there are boards that are taking these awful books out of the library. Our board um, and our um, curriculum review committee has really been working to say, let's identify mature content in our library Let's label those and let's make sure parents have the ability of seeing books in our library and then letting you know what those books are and then alerting you. Um, we're, we're, we're not about taking books out of our library. Um, but we do know like there are books in our elementary libraries that, that are great for fifth graders, but you may not want your kindergartner checking out. And the, there, are book, there, are, there are lists that say, you know, 
here's mature content for K to three, but really may not be mature content for fifth and fourth. And we have a system, a thoughtlet libraries, that actually allow parent access, and we've not used that. At the high school, I don't know how many parents know, you can log in and actually see the collection at the library, of, in the library. Um, I don't know how many of you know that. You can go onto the website right now and actually go in and see every book that's in the library here at, at the high school. And so we're trying to make sure you know that. But what we're planning to do um, by the end of the year is to set up a system where you as a parent can say, I'm fine with my child checking out anything, or I do want to be notified, or I'm going to restrict my child and ask that you send a permission slip home for my child. So what that will look like is if, my, if I restrict or if I want to be notified, my child checks out a book that's on a mature list, I'll get an email when my child check that, checks that out. So I'll get an email in my email box saying, hey, by the way, your child's checked out this book. It's on a mature list. That's all that's going to happen. Or if you say, I don't want my child to check it out, the librarian will have a little red thing, and they'll give the child a slip, and they'll bring it home to you, and you'll sign it saying, yeah, I'll let them check that out. And they'll bring it back, and your child will check it out. If you sign a slip saying, I'm fine with my child checking out any book, they'll be able to check it out. So that's a balanced approach that our district is taking. And I think that's very balanced. I, I don't think, again, um, our district is trying to, again, usurp your right. They're trying to empower you. And, and, and I really applaud them for that, because I think that's a balanced way of saying, you're in charge, we aren't. And so um, just to be very clear, um, your rights are important to us. And we're trying very hard to empower you. Um, and I appreciate that on behalf of our board. So I'm going to open it up for questions. I appreciate your tolerating as I've gone through all of that with you. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on some of it. It was a lot to get through. Um, I'm going to repeat your question just so that anyone uh, watching has the opportunity to hear the question. So if you have a question, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll repeat it and then try to answer it. Anyone have a question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, yes, sir. Sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm trying to, you said something about at three months. Yeah, come on up, come on up. So I, I want to make sure I heard everything you said, so. Yep. And earlier, when you were talking about earlier, earlier tonight, you were talking about ch challenging Howard Cardinal Pride. Mm -hmm. And as a student here, I have not experienced either of your statements. Okay. And how can I make sure that you understand what I'm experiencing? Okay. What are you? What? Tell me what you're. You, what you are you experiencing? Well, I know at the middle school you said that we should be getting talked to about mm -hmm. the. Safe to tell. Have you had any safe to tell lessons this year? So you I have not. I was last year and I didn't get them last year. My brother graduated last year and he didn't get anything. Okay. And the only things we have are like posters like that. Okay. Only two paper sizes. Okay. So you have had no safe to tell lessons at school this year? No. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate you telling me. That needs to change. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Other questions? Please. Great, thank you. I don't see a lot of people raising their hands, so I think they may have a couple of questions here. 
Please. But there are going to be around your discussions about community funding and building stuff. Please. Really concerns me that you as a superintendent have no faith in the power of community is willing to pay more for our students' mm -hmm. education. So does that mean I don't have to yell now? No, you still have to yell for him, but the people on the stream can hear you now. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> that way I won't so, have to repeat everything you say. <laughs> so, gotcha. So again, and it's not, I'm not being argumentative, it's more mm -hmm. questions because I, I do think that this is something important. We as a community Agreed. should be getting some kind of word out to our community members to say, look, we need to be able to do stuff. So a couple of questions. Mm -hmm. What local municipalities vote where their votes affect the Elizabeth School District? It, everyone who lives within the Elizabeth School District boundary votes on a school district mill levy. And do you have information? I mean, and it may not be for tonight, yeah. Yeah. but to me, it's identifying who those voters are. Yeah, a, a majority of them are non-parents. Okay. Okay, and, and, and we watched a similar ballot initiative in Kiowa just this past November go down very rat very handily and that's the challenge understood okay. and I'm, i am not doubting yeah. your statements that it's a challenge yeah. no no i, I um, understand so for us in elizabeth school district who or what entity would typically oversee the efforts to increase the mill levy to sub to try to get that presented to the voters. Who would normally oversee that and run that? Do we go to our school board and say, you sponsor that? Yeah. Is it just us community members? I don't know. A, a mill levy would be placed on the ballot by the board. Once the board places it on the ballot, right. then it would need to be a citizen committee who would campaign and take that to the voters. And so once the, once the board of education would place it on the ballot, it becomes a citizen committee that would then have to campaign for that to happen. So the, the Board of Education, based upon a Fair Campaign Practices Act, would then have to allow that campaign committee to actually campaign for that. Awesome. Can I take that question? Hang on, hang on. Hang on. Go, go ahead. When, are there any current efforts or previous efforts in the past five years of our school board to initiate that process. We, I, we, I'm uneducated, I don't know. Sure. I'm not meaning this attacking our school board members. Sure, yeah. We, the last mill levy I'm was sorry. in 2017, <laughs> and it was at such a time when the bond, the last bond actually was being paid off. And so the, the local taxpayers were about to cease paying a bond, and the, the board at that time said, you're about to stop paying this tax, would you allow us to keep it and do this mill levy equal to that amount? And, and that passed. In 2017? 2017, and that's for a $1.5 million mill levy, that's that 6% levy that, that was up on the screen. Um, and we collect about 1.2 million. There's about 300,000 that's uncollected and delinquent taxes. Gotcha. So, but right now, seven years later, six to seven years yeah. later, there's no current efforts. Okay. There's not. And, and again, yeah. it, that's shocking to me. Again, I'm yeah. not meeting this argumentative, yep. but that's shocking yep. to me that you're telling the community yep. that this is your greatest concern. Yeah. You told us your greatest worry. How am I going to build another school? Sure. So yeah. do you, I will ask, oh, that's, I don't want to get political. Yeah. Well, let me, <laughs> let me, let me. Give, it sounds let me to me you like you don't have the support too. you need. Yeah, there, there were, there were, my understanding, and I'm new to this community, there, mm -hmm. there were numerous other efforts, and there are local community members who can speak to that. There were numerous other efforts prior to that that failed. In 2000, there was a superintendent and a CFO who were caught embezzling money from the district that shook this community. Uh, okay. And every effort from that point forward failed. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. So that so 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 there's history there that has caused the community to say. Understood. And again, I'm not meeting it argumentatively. Oh no, no, I, I don't. Your think statements so. tonight on the budget and the and the money that we have is extremely shocking to me. Yeah. I know personally, I wouldn't mind spending that five hundred dollars more or whatever that you said there, five hundred bucks more a year in my taxes, so my son can have better schools. That's right. for me. That's a no-brainer. But I understand other people may not be, and we have to honor the right. community. Right. Um, I think I did have one last question. Oh. If we got into a school levy, and, and you may not know the answer to this, but would it be possible to bring a something on the ballot to the community to say we would love to increase the mill levy or we wouldn't mind as a community having our taxes increased if that money was earmarked specifically for teacher salaries? Yes. There is an ability to do yes. that. Yes, and, and actually that, that, to be very honest with you, is what I would like to do first, okay. because frankly, I do believe, based upon the history of this community, that trust is what we must earn. We must earn trust first. And then I do believe at some point a bond is necessary. Um, we can't, for the rest of our lives, build charter schools. Right. Um, so we will need to improve our facilities. We, we, we can't admire the problem and say, well, we're gonna overcrowd our schools for the next 10 years while we build trust. So a, a charter school is one option that might buy us some time. We can't tell our teachers, continue to make 40,000 or 43,000 for the rest of your lives. I believe a small mill levy, 10 to $13 a month, is something that if we are transparent, if we earn their trust, We'll, we'll, we'll build that trust within our community that five years down the road, we can go back and say, we've earned your trust, we've done what we've said, we've attracted teachers, we've kept teachers. Now, will you give us that ability to build this school? We've continued to grow, we've attracted the teachers, we've done every, everything we've said we've done, mm -hmm. now let's ask you for that. So, does that and make sense? It does make sense, and in addition to building that trust, I personally live just behind the Walmart in the Gold Creek Valley area. Yep. I know our neighborhood just finished being built about a year ago, yep. so there's a lot of folks in that neighborhood and a lot of voters here that would not have even known about the past. You've got independents. You've got yep. people that independence wasn't there. They're not gonna know about the past. You've got people yep. up there across from the golf course, um, Spring Valley. I agree. I'm hoping that we're not acting or we're not trying yep. to pursue more money yep. just on that. And again, I'm Agreed. saying all of this out of ignorance. So my final yep. question is, who would be a good contact for me to talk about about these things to get better educated and hopefully volunteer and help out? I would love to sit down with you and, and, and engage with you. And I think probably a board member or two as well could okay. sit down and, and talk further with you. About Great. Your Thank board. you. To kind of ride those coattails, I just... Oh, okay, sorry. Can, can she can go this way? There you go. <laughs> to ride those coattails, it seems like the growth around here is scary fast. Mm -hmm. um, it feels like there should be a way to capitalize off of that, like a tap fee for the water, like uh, power access, mm -hmm. fees that are built into new construction yeah. through the county. Yep. Um, why can't there be a thousand dollar five thousand whatever number yep. tap fee to be welcome into our district we, we just increase those okay all right <laughs> yeah we we actually just, and what is that amount now we we actually just went from 500 um to 2600 i'm i'm trying to remember off the top of my head but we 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 more than tripled that fee good that's good here. And then you're, the, the graph you showed about the other communities and the mill levies that they have passed, mm -hmm. why were they successful? What was the secret sauce that they figured out? I'm going to be very honest with you. Their secret sauce was 51% was adequate for them. Um, they, they, they ran campaigns of 51% passage was acceptable. And, and I'm going to be very honest with you. 
When you pass a, a mill levy or a bond with 51%, you have 49% of your community that is very angry. We live in a small town. We, we as a community, need to, to, to somehow unite. We have to unite if we're gonna be successful as a community. And I agree with that. Are there any programs that can pull the community here? So the art teacher opens up and does an expanded community education on come paint, learn how to paint. Yep. Do, does, does a shop class open yep. up to the community and say, yep. hey, if you need an oil change on the third Thursday of every month, yep. The shop yeah. kit, like that kind of thing of pulling them Absolutely. onto campus. Absolutely. Are there programs like that that I'm not? I, I have a ki kindergartner and a preschooler, yeah. so I'm not. <laughs> I'm not into the middle school and high school programs yet. But are there programs like that that are drawing the community uh, our to the campus? Is, as, as we open our career and technical education, we'd love our auto shop to become an auto shop in the evening for our adults. We'd love. We'd love to open an auto shop class at night. For our adults in our in our in our community who would like to take auto shop classes, we'd love any of these programs that we're bringing to our community to become programs for our adults too. And I think the more we can open our schools to our community, the more our community is going to be supported by us. Frontier, our vision for Frontier is it becomes a community center. Obviously, that takes money to invest in Frontier, and that's been our challenge, is we're not gonna take money away from our kids to invest in Frontier. That's why selling the parking lots allowed us to take money and invest in Frontier. We're not gonna take it out of our classrooms to do that. Right, but, but people would pay for stuff like that. Right, like community exactly, members would pay exactly. to join, to do yeah. ESL classes, yeah. GED yeah. classes, those kind of things that pull people from right. the community and integrate right. them. Right, but yeah, getting our, getting our auto shop built is step one and then right. I think that becomes something that we can certainly do. So the, the more we do for our community, then I think the more the community buys in. Homeschool population was something we did nothing for until this year. The fact that we have homeschoolers who say, you care about us, you've opened up a school to us, you're allowing us to come in, that, that, that's a game changer. We have 130 kids who, who now feel like we care about them. That, that's, that's 130 voters that prior to this year thought we could care less. That's true. See, okay. see my strategy. I see progress. Good. Okay. Good. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hi. So um, I know you talked about you had a parent that was ejected from the game last night and um, kind of some of the weird racial things that are happening, mostly middle school and high school, because kids, hormones, they're trying to learn, they're trying to be independent, right? Mm -hmm. um, so my child has had a lot of issues at the middle school and the high school with being called the N-word and get into fights about it, where we have a zero policy when it comes to get into fights and all that kind of physical stuff. But we don't seem to have a zero um, tolerance policy against any of these other discriminatory things that are happening. Um, so are we going to start putting that in our handbook or are we looking at making some of those changes through the handbooks as we start having more people coming into this community? That, that was our conversation on Tuesday was, mm -hmm. was we, we need to look systemically top down of, of what's in our handbook. We, we've looked at our discipline logs, and, and we do have children who are being disciplined for all of those things you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. The challenge is it's not changing. It's not changing the behaviors. Mm -hmm. And again, then when you look out in your community and you say, well, it's happening with our adults. Mm -hmm. If it's happening with our adults and disciplining our children is not causing it to change, we, we've got to do something different. And that's where we said, okay, how, how do we change our culture? Because discipline, Discipline is about learning, and if, if what's happening, if the consequence isn't changing the behavior, then we've got to take a different track to change the behavior. Um, and obviously, that's where we said, okay, how do we change the culture in the building where kids start turning? You know, when, 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 I, when, when we were growing up, you know, why, why, would you, why would you call someone a name? Because it got reaction from your friends, right? If it didn't get reaction from your friends, you stopped. And so how does the culture change where all of a sudden people are like, knock it off. That, that's, that's, that's not all right. That's not acceptable in this culture. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, what, that's where we're taking it. 
But, but I would agree with you. It, it's not as prevalent in our handbook as it needs to be. Mm. There's discipline occurring, at least what we're seeing when we pull the log to say, th there's, a, there's a state discipline code that, that clearly outlines discrimination, uh, language of discrimination. It's, it's being noted in our, in, in our discipline log, but obviously it's not being effective. Yes. And so we've got to figure out how to do that. And then, so with that being stated, we're just talking about, hey, we want to, you want to, maybe we pay an extra $500, $600 in taxes, mm -hmm. but if I feel like my son can't be kept safe along with my yeah. three other kids that are in the district, yeah. why would I pay that? No, agreed. No. And like for it to be expressed to me that my son has a target on his back, right. when we're talking about we have highly trained people that are carrying guns in our school along with security that aren't carrying guns and then I'm like, well, my one son with his walking target is yeah. kind of a, not a good yeah. thing to look at, especially with things that are happening in the country as far as gun violence and things like that. I, I would love to sit down with you and the school administration at your children's school and I think we, we really need to put our heads together and make sure we have a plan, that, that we are doing something immediately to make sure that you're comfortable, that we have actions in place, that, that we don't just say, we're doing our best. That's not okay. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'd love to, before you leave here tonight, let's, let's schedule some time. Okay. Let's sit down and make sure that we take care of that. Okay. Okay, thank you, appreciate it. Yes, ma'am. Um, my experience is with the middle school and high school soft sports teams are mostly coached by teachers. Mm -hmm. Are they being compensated for that, or does that somehow fold into this compensation proposal no, that, where they can get points for doing no, things like absolutely coaching? Not. It, it, is, it is separate. So coaching, coaching clubs are all outside of that. Um, that is actually another step. So we're doing, we've done licensed, we're doing classified, Coaching is next. We're actually pulling a team of coaches together. Um, and we do need to actually do an analysis of that compared to our neighboring districts. Um, because I'm not sure we, we have not compared ourselves to neighboring districts. So I, I can't stand here and tell you, sure, we're comparable or we're fair. I can be very honest with you and tell you, I'm not sure we are. And so that will happen before the end of the year. I'm so grateful um, for their time and their, their I skills for kids. I completely agree. Uh, what they do for our kids is amazing. And, and I wish I could tell you for sure that, oh, surely they're compensated fairly. Um, I'm not going to stand here and tell you that. Um, but I will tell you before the end of the year, we will be able to tell you that we have adjusted those. Um, I am going to also tell you that based upon our finances, I'm starting to worry that we're going to be able to get everyone where they need to be. and. Um, we're gonna do our very best, and obviously, um, we have to. We have to do what's right by people, so, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, yes, ma'am, over here. And if you can't answer tonight, because there's not enough time, and we're going to weeks, but when you mentioned the classical school, the master mm -hmm. and option, what's the main difference between a rig, like what we see now and a classical school? Just like a brief kind of overview, so you can just Class, class, classical school, in brief, is, is kind of a, a back-to-basics approach. So the question was, what, what is a classical, classical school compared to what we have? Classical school is much more of a back-to-basics, uh, less reliance on technology, more reliance on, on, on classical stories, um, uh, traditional social studies, traditional American values, understanding the founding of the country, um, really um, driven by uh, basically what you and I had in school. Um, so I would encourage you to come on the 28th. We've got um, uh, John Adams Schools is, is a very strong classical uh, school operation company. Um, they're the group that we've asked if they would come. Um, you know, there are classical schools that have some religious connotation. That's not what we're looking for. John Adams is a, is a, is a very secular, 
classical school company. Um, and they're the ones who are going to come and actually go through what, what they do as a classical company. Um, and so that's, that's the group that will come. Okay? Not that that's the only group, but we just thought we have to have someone. So that's a group that I've contacted. Okay, thank you. Another question. Yes. Uh huh. So my son's at the middle school in sixth grade, and we've been doing Zern. Did anyone do any of the lessons in Zern before it was implemented? Um, does anyone have any experience with it? Because the three lessons a week for 90 minutes is not our experience. My son's been doing it since 4.30 today, and he's still working on one lesson. Yeah, I am. Um... I have mixed emotions on Zern. I've seen Zern used differently in each classroom. And actually, Kimberly Runyon and I have had some conversations about Zern. Zern was purchased by the state. It was offered to schools across the state at no, at no cost. This year, it was actually state adoption, which is kind of interesting. Um, it's not something the state has done often. Um, it is very different at each grade level at Elizabeth Middle School. and so. Um, obviously, you know that the middle school's gone through some pretty drastic transitions, and so Kimberly has actually just in the last uh, couple of weeks has started to really look at, at the implementation of Zern. And so it is something that she's spending some time right now trying to look at how it's being implemented at each grade level. I've had parents at each grade level have different experiences uh, with it. Um, so I would encourage you, if you have concerns, to, to reach out to Kimberly and, and share what you're seeing and what your concerns are, um, because it is something we need to determine, is it what we want to use or not? Um, in the, as I shared, we had no math curriculum at the, the middle school. We were using a free resource that in the absence of nothing, when uh, Brett Michael arrived there three years ago or two and a half years ago, um, Brett brought something. Um, and they were using it, and it was, again, probably better than nothing. Um, I'm not sure that we're where we need to be, but when the state brought this resource, um, we purchased, or, or when they gave it to us, there were printed materials, and I don't believe we printed any materials until Kimberly got there, and then all of a sudden we were like, why aren't we using the printed materials? We were only using the online materials. So when she got there, I believe we started using some of the printed materials. So I would encourage you to reach out to her um, and, and let her know what you're seeing, what your concern is. And we need, to, we need to make sure that if it's not what you feel like we need as a parent, that we still have the opportunity. Of... It definitely needs to be looked at because he's been doing it for four hours on one lesson just today. Okay. And that, this is that. not something that's yeah. you know, a one-off. We do this frequently. We spend two and three hours. And he is on the lowest math class and he does a minimum of four lessons a week. And yeah. okay. he has a friend okay. in the advanced class that does eight to 10 a week. Okay, what, what grade? Sixth grade. Okay. Um, and it doesn't teach him because then they do the test and he gets a two because okay. he doesn't understand any of the material. Okay. Um, so I had a question on that. And then spelling, why don't we do spelling in the elementary? I have a fourth grader who still can't spell what. Okay. They started spelling, they did, did it for two weeks, and then they stopped. My card is on that table. Could, will you give me a call? <laughs> I'd love to. I've already met with you once about it. Oh, Nothing's actually, happened. now now I recognize you. I'm sorry. You're <laughs> okay. Let, before you leave tonight, can we chat? I'd yeah. love to follow up. Okay. All right. Is there any other hand over there? Oops, I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. I'd just like to thank you for your quick responsiveness when we email you, contact you, call you. I think I'm still waiting for two years ago for our superintendent to return my phone call from another school district. Oh. So I just want to thank you and applaud thank you for that. I appreciate it. I try. I'm, I will say this, um, I'm far from perfect. So if, if there, there's been one or once or twice where someone's called and I've missed it. So if, 
if, if I do that, please don't hesitate to reach back out. So I'm glad I didn't miss yours. Um, so if I do, please do just reach back out again. So thank you. All right. Yes, ma'am. I just, I had more of a clarification. Sure. When you were discussing the compensation plan earlier, mm -hmm. you had mentioned a $3,500 every year increase, no. but your graphic shows every four years. So could you just clarify the correct? Yeah, it's, it's $3,500 when 100 points are earned. So I, yeah, it's not every year. It's every four um, years. It's, it's, it's when 100 points are earned. Not the points. If a, if a teacher doesn't do any, if they just do their regular job and they don't put in the extra, every four years they not, automatically? Not necessarily every four years, no. Because when they do their professional development at school, they earn points for that. When they set their goal with their principal, if they achieve that goal, if they exceed that goal, there's points that are earned. So there's points they earn for things they do that are required. And so when they earn 100 points, they get 25 points for coming back each year. So they may earn 100 points sooner than every four years. Um, so it's when they earn 100 points, they move 3,500 points. OK, or I was referencing the graphic that you had showed, where it was giving the examples of like teacher A, B, and C and the path. Yep. It showed every three or four years was $3,500. And you had compared that to, I believe it was, $3,386 on the current plan. Yep. And so I just wanted to clarify, because that's about $41 a year more for the average teacher that doesn't put in extra, 78 cents a week on the new plan, if a teacher doesn't do anything extra. Yep. So I just, I think you misspoke earlier. You said that that raises every year of 3,500. Yeah. And that's yeah. all, I just wanted to clarify yeah. that it's actually no. every four. Yeah. No, I've never said 3,500 okay. a year. Um, Thank you. Again, I, I very clearly said they can't move every year. It wouldn't be affordable. If we could have moved teachers 3,500 a year, we would have done a long time ago. $3,500 is when they earn 100 points, and there's a variety of ways they can earn points. A teacher who they, they may not move in for four years if they are absent on their professional development days, if they don't achieve their goals, it, it's conceivable someone wouldn't move for four, four years, um, but it's highly unlikely. So, OK. All right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. Oh, no worries. I already had a chance before. Um, first of all, I do want to second the, the lady below, the lady below, the lady's previous comment, uh, thanking you for the time. This is my second forum. I've been with you and on the school board, uh, one of the school board meetings as well, and you Thank seem you. to be quite open, and I definitely appreciate that. Yep. No, I appreciate the, it. My question's probably going to be a real easy softball question because it sounds like too easy of a solution. You're looking for another school, but I understand the school board still owns an old high school downtown that was just recently shut down. So could you share a little bit about why that wouldn't be viable to maybe invest or fix up? Um, You're going to a presentation, so I hope I didn't miss it. <laughs> yeah. Frontier, Frontier um, it is. Thank you. Yeah. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll, it is a softball question. Thank you. Um, let me get to the slide that will help me with that. So it is, oops, wait, darn it. So it is right here. <laughs> so all the growth is up here, and the school is right here. So it is right down where all the other buildings are. So, so it, it is in the cluster where all of the existing buildings are. So we would be transporting mass students to the bottom location, it's about 17 miles. And so it, it, it would, not, not many parents are going to say, yeah, I'll transport my kids 17 miles. It, it, would, it would be an excessive transport for many kids. Does that make sense? Probably would make sense to somebody who was more involved in it. My first thought would be, if you're talking about building a new school, you're talking millions and millions and millions of dollars. If you're talking about busing students to an existing school, even 17 miles, how many years would the extra 
labor and fuel to transport those kids add up to the millions and millions and millions of dollars for a new school? I, again, I'm asking yeah. out of ignorance. Yeah. I'm sure no. you guys have already worked it. No. The, the other challenges right now is um, I need bus drivers. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff will tell you right now, I, I can't transport kids across the street to Running Creek Elementary because I don't have enough bus drivers. So I, I would also need massive numbers of bus drivers and massive buses, which I can't afford to get kids from up there down. And so that's another challenge I'd have. Is it, is it possible? Um, our, our challenge in public education is more often than not parents want a neighborhood school. They want a school closer to where their kids are close enough to come home. What would more than likely happen, in my experience as a, in public education, is parents would say, now go to Douglas County, those schools are closer. I forget, I'm sorry, you can choose your schools out here, right? I'm originally from Florida, yep. and your address dictates yeah. where you go to school. So that's yeah. why I was wondering why you didn't have a choice. Yeah. So sorry about that yeah. then. No. If parents can choose to go no. somewhere else, then I mean, yeah, I I'll, I'll give you an point. example. Right now, we're, we're, struggling to keep, we're struggling to keep our child care program open at Singing Hills. We don't, we're, 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 we don't have staff for our child care program at Singing Hills. We're working right now with Elizabeth Parks and Rec program who is interested in taking it over. The child care regulation and, and licensing rules are challenging to say the least to get someone who's qualified. If we don't have a licensing, if we don't have licensed child care, those families probably will leave Singing Hills and go to a school that has child care. I mean, that's the challenge right now is, is we'll go to a school that has what we need. And, and so, um, and, and again, I don't blame families for that. It's, it's, it, it's kind of what, what we have to do um, to survive. And so parents are busy, they, they need what they need. And so we, as a district, want to make sure we provide our families what they need. That makes sense? It makes total sense okay. bringing in the idea of Parents can choose to move their kids yep. to another district. Yep. Totally left my mind. Okay. Thank you. So it was yep. a softball. <laughs> no problem. Yep. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you. On the back table, there are some uh, cards. Please don't hesitate to grab one. Um, I would love to sit down uh, with any of you who would like to talk further about uh, your questions and try to do some more problem solving. Um, as you see, there's a lot of moving parts. Um, we are far from perfect, but hopefully you see we're trying to move the district in the right direction. I do want to recognize we have a number of school board members here, Heather Booth, Rhonda Olson, Mary Powell. Um, I don't know if John Waller is here. Um, and I didn't see Mike Callahan come in. So I want to thank them for being here and for their support um, uh, of our district. Um, but thank you to parents not only here, but those who are able to watch from home. Uh, don't hesitate to reach out and ask if you have questions. Uh, we have a lot of moving parts in the district. I have an amazing team. We have amazing teachers in the district. Do take a moment uh, to thank our staff, amazing bus drivers, amazing cooks. Um, we have people who are committed to your kids. You see we're not paying them nearly what others are being paid in neighboring districts. Um, a thanks goes a long way. So when you see a teacher, when you see a bus driver, when you see folks in our district, stop and just say thank you um, because it does mean a lot to them. So thank you very much. Have a great evening.